Anne of Green Gables, L.M. Montgomery wrote, I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. Every fall when October rolls around, we expect to see the changing of the leaves, we enjoy football games and bonfires, and we often aren't surprised when we see ghosts and witches crisscrossing the streets asking for candy. Halloween is a favorite holiday among all ages. It's a time when children can dress up in fun or scary costumes, hoping to fill their jack-o'-lanterns with candy. In today's world, we don't flinch if we see a girl dressed in all black, carrying a broom and cackling like a witch. But centuries ago, the thought of witchcraft was real, and women were taken to trial for such accusations. Associate Professor Dr. Jen McNabb has spent years researching and teaching early modern Europe and England history and knows very well what women who were accused of being a witch went through. And that's why we asked her to take a seat in the purple chair. I think my entry into the study of witchcraft was based on my teaching interest. It's a topic that students are sort of perennially fascinated by. I've actually taught witchcraft here at WIU a number of different times. I've taught it as a graduate seminar. I've taught honors courses in witchcraft. I've taught some undergraduate seminars in witchcraft. And then I teach a sequence in British history. And I include witchcraft uh, in that coverage as well. So my own research deals with legal cases, um, prosecution for various misdemeanor offenses in the church courts, and witchcraft, a lot of the records generated on the topic come from legal records. So I was already sort of close in terms of my sources. And one of the things that was really important to witchcraft in the period that I study, 16th and 17th centuries, is um, a set of ideas about the power of language that words had power um, to actually be acted upon. They could cause harm. They could um, cause good things to take place, but usually harm. And so I was already looking at court records to study language and what are known as defamation cases. When people insulted one another, um, the injured party would go to court and try to recoup his or her reputation. And reputation was really important to witchcraft as well. So that's how my own research kind of dovetailed with the study of of witchcraft, the focus on language and legal processes. Witchcraft on the surface looks like a very um, easily accessible topic. It seems people in the past were prejudiced or stupid, um, just kind of uh, bigots, and that's why witchcraft prosecution happened in the period between sort of 1450 and 1750. But when you begin to study the topic, you notice that it's very complex. And instead, witchcraft is not about sheer bigotry and ignorance. It's about social tensions. It's about contestation of gender roles. It's about religious concerns. It's about the law. You can't prosecute someone on a charge of witchcraft unless witchcraft is illegal under the law. So we saw in early modern Europe this um, sort of process of criminalizing witchcraft. And so once you start teasing out all the details, I think people are often surprised at how complex and sophisticated a topic it is. Well, the idea of assigning witchcraft with women is something that is historically accurate. Um, my own focus is on the state of England in the 16th and 17th centuries. And although the records are not perfect from that time period, somewhere around 90% of all of those accused of witchcraft were women. So there's a very strong uh, gender bias in terms of those accused. And I think that sort of comes down to us in the legacy of the older woman uh, with the sort of deformities, facial deformities, and the broomstick and the cat. Um, there is some historical basis for that more stereotypical image. Um, and I actually came prepared with a little research on this point. One of the early demonologists, someone who wrote about witchcraft in the 16th century in England was a writer named Reginald Scott. And Scott, unlike most of his contemporaries, was not convinced that witchcraft was real. He's often identified as an early skeptic. So he looked at the society around him and tried to distinguish what it was that accused witches had in common. And this is what he said. One sort of such as are said to be witches are women, 
which be commonly old, lame, bleary-eyed, pale, foul, and full of wrinkles, poor, sullen, superstitious, and papist, or such as know no religion. So that's a very sort of stereotypical idea about witchcraft. The old woman who is sort of a blight on her community. Uh, she's maybe a beggar. She doesn't have enough money to take care of herself. So I think a number of those ideas have come down to us in the legacy of witchcraft. Another thing that's kind of interesting about the common perception of witchcraft that persists into our period is the idea of pet familiars, um, the old woman with the cat, for example. That was true in early modern England, this belief that witches could use animals to work their malevolent will upon others. So in other words, cats, frogs, other sorts of small animals, uh, were seen to be imbued with a kind of demonic power, and they were under the witch's control in a sort of um, bizarre parallel of um, mothering, the witches fed their familiars blood. Um, they allowed their pet familiars to suck blood from them, and then that cemented the bond between witch and animal as a sort of um, alternate of the mother cementing her bond with a child through breastfeeding. So there was a lot of anxiety about motherhood in the early modern period that's also indicative of um, material that comes from these trial testimonies. A number of scholars have looked at um, commonalities between the American version of witchcraft and uh, the English version of witchcraft. There are some rather interesting and distinct characteristics to each. In England, 90% of those accused were women. Most of the men who were accused were sons of witches or husbands of witches, but they had some kind of kinship tie uh, to a purported witch. Witches in England tended to be poorer. They tended to be from a lower socioeconomic spectrum, and they were accused by people who were of a slightly elevated social spectrum. So accusations trended downward from the middling sort to the less well-off. Salem was different in that the gender balance was not as pronounced as in England the century or so before. And in Salem, the socioeconomic um, trends were different as well. It tended to be um, sometimes those of more elevated status being targeted for accusations. That happened a little bit in England and a number of continental countries as well. And again, this is part of the reason that I find witchcraft so fascinating is that there, there is no single formula. Witchcraft uh, was different things in different places at different times. There are some common themes and patterns, but each locality sort of had its own brand of witchcraft. Well, scholars suggest that there's something about this time of the year where we come to the end of the living season and are approaching the dying season. And that is a moment in which the natural world is sort of most primed for supernatural occurrences, um, that the membrane between the two worlds is thinnest at this time of the year. Uh, the, festival of Halloween is in fact from an older Celtic celebration of that shift from one season to another. So I think that notion of time giving way to something that is more desolate uh, lends itself to a consideration of uh, magic and witchcraft, which was often thought to be used by those in desperate circumstances, those who were in need, and this is a needy season, or it used to be in the early modern period. In modern popular culture, probably the most famous example of witchcraft these days is Harry Potter. And those witches uh, at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry are supposed to be learning how to harness supernatural power for good. And there were, in fact, good witches in the early modern period. Uh, they were often referred to in England by the term cunning folk. And cunning doesn't necessarily mean scheming or tricky, it means wise. And so in the late medieval period and early modern period in England, there were wise men and women who were thought to provide 
useful assistance to their neighbors. So if you lost something valuable, you might contact a cunning man or woman and that person would divine the whereabouts of your valuables and then would take perhaps a nominal fee for that. So the idea of good witches, and I guess we could maybe even trace that back to the Wizard of Oz, the, the conflict between the good witches and the bad witches, there is historical uh, there is an historical authenticity about that. So pop culture has some things uh, correct, but many others not so correct. Early modern witchcraft was very much about people needing answers to phenomena they could not explain. This was a time period, uh, my students talk about this all the time once they review the evidence, that it's a time of tension and hardship. There were a number of economic troubles in the early modern period, civil war, religious upheaval, uh, that sort of coincides with this rise in witchcraft prosecutions. And so the big question then becomes why? Why did people naturally sort of gravitate to this notion that there was someone to blame? A number of students identify what's happening with witchcraft as a form of scapegoating. People are dealing with crisis and misfortune and want to put their anxieties, their fears, their concerns onto a physical manifestation that they can understand. If they don't know disease, then their suffering child seems like a punishment from God. That's language that they would have used. And there was a, a real reticence about accepting responsibility for that. If you didn't want to feel that you were punished by God, it had to be someone else's fault. So who might that be? Well, it might be that old woman who lives at the edge of the village who always seems very cantankerous and who is frequently begging uh, for her sustenance. And in fact, there's a, a theme in witchcraft scholarship called the charity refused model. It's the product of the work of two scholars, Keith Thomas and Alan McFarlane. They wrote their seminal pieces in the early 1970s. And basically what they said is that the reason for the rise in prosecutions of witches in the early modern period, beginning in the 1500s and into the 1600s, had to do with changing notions of charity. In the late Middle Ages, there were people who lived in communities who needed assistance. The uh, elderly, orphaned children, um, wounded soldiers, and there was a, a sort of ideological imperative that said it was the community's responsibility to take care of these people. Part of that ideology was linked to religion. The medieval church encouraged the idea that people needed to do good works and that would help them attain heaven in the afterlife. So they were supposed to perform charitable tasks, whether that was giving their tithe to the church, their 10%, whether that was um, giving charitable alms to people who deserved it. There was a real sense that there was a rightness about those kind of actions. In the early 16th century, however, there's a religious cataclysm with the coming of what's known as the Reformation. The Reformation initiates a reconceptualization of ideas about salvation. And one of the most important strands of Reformation thought challenged the idea of good works as necessary to be saved. And instead, the focus was on faith. You had faith first. That was the, that was the primary um, item necessary for salvation. And so what Thomas and McFarlane posit in their works is that there's a connection between this new thought about salvation and charity, that people were less charitable than before. So the classic trope here is that an older woman who's hungry and thirsty knocks on the door of a neighbor's house and said, I, I need some charity. I need to eat. I haven't had anything today. I need bread and ale. And the people of the household do something different than they might have done 200 years before and say, no, you know, we worked hard for this. Uh, lots of um, hard work and energy went into our household success and we're not willing to share. The old woman in this scenario would walk away rather put out and according to records from the time period, often cursing and mumbling under her breath. 
in the coming weeks, perhaps some misfortune occurs. A child falls sick, or there's um, a, a death of livestock, or this is kind of interesting because we tend to associate witchcraft, harmful magic with actions only against people that it's harmful for individuals or for animals. But there were charges where individuals said, um, I know that she was cursing me because I couldn't churn my butter or because my beer spoiled. So witches were thought to be able to take what was pure and good and ruin them as revenge. So to, to come back to the scenario then, the old woman mumbles and, and walks away cursing and then something bad happens and the householders remember those words and think she was really ticked off. This has got to be her vengeance. Some scholars have posited that what's happening there is a rather significant dose of guilt. That the householders on one hand feel good about taking what is theirs and keeping it theirs, but on the other feel an intense guilt in that they did not live up to older ideas about neighborliness and taking care of the less fortunate in the community. Um, so it's a very complex relationship, but that's what the charity refused model, um, which dominated a, a lot of historiographical investigation in the 1970s and 80s, really focused on was this changing notion of how people should take care of one another in this post-Reformation age or in the age of Reformation. I think witchcraft served a need. And my students often cotton on to this in their papers. Once they've read through this material, they say it's interesting that witchcraft seemed to address some kind of societal problem. People experienced every ordina everyday ordinary kind of difficulties and were looking for explanations. And when they couldn't find them by alternate means, they focused on what seemed accessible which was the cranky old woman. Now, there are some interesting, there's some interesting divergence between elite ideas about witchcraft and more popular views. Belief in witchcraft was fairly universal in the early modern period. Reginald Scott, the writer that I quoted, um, was relatively unique in the 16th century in saying this witchcraft thing isn't real. It's about people imagining that they can find someone to blame for their troubles. He also refers to um, the women themselves as deluded, that they might believe that they had the power to cause harm, but that was a product of their own fevered minds. Most people in the 16th and 17th centuries did not hold to Scott's skeptic view. Instead, they believed that witchcraft was a powerful force in the world. Witchcraft was criminalized in early modern England by parliamentary statute in 1563. They said, this is a problem in our realm. It's despoiling Her Majesty's uh, uh, subjects, and we've got to take action because this is a problem that is not being properly addressed. And then they set out very clear criteria for what constituted acts of harmful magic and what kind of punishments should be accorded to those found guilty. The most severe acts of harmful magic were punished by death. It was a felony offense. They had then gradations. They would say if you caused harm but stopped short of causing death, imprisonment would follow. And at four times during the year, you would be trotted out to the central point of the village and put on display to be sort of mocked and chastised by your neighbors and also to serve as an example to others of the dangers of pretending a power that you should not possess. Early modern witchcraft was thought very much to be linked to the power of the devil. So witches were servants of the devil. They had created some kind of compact this was often described not so much in trial testimony. It's not so much average folk talking about the devil. It's instead in more scholarly writings from the period, these so-called demonologies that were usually authored by theologians. So ministers of the church 
waxing eloquent uh, and sort of alarmist on the powers of the devil and their human agents in the form of witches. And so uh, those more elite beliefs were very much focused on this covenant with the devil. They're very scripture heavy. When you read these demonologies, uh, the elite authors are trying to justify their position on the basis of scriptural evidence. I mean, there's a very famous line from the Old Testament, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, that seemed to suggest it was the duty of the godly to go out and identify witches and make sure they were properly punished. And most of the 16th century demonologies make uh, great use of that particular line as an indicator that witchcraft was real. The demonologist wrote in this very, um, with a great deal of hyperbole, uh, you could feel the panic in their writings. They, they were thinking this is a social and religious ill that people aren't paying enough attention to. And so we've got to raise the hue and cry with our scholarship and our understanding of theology to make sure people understand what a problem witchcraft poses because the witch is just not causing harm of his or her own volition, but because that individual is in league with the devil. And so interestingly, some of the demonologists even said that about good witches. They said good witches are in fact even more dangerous because people think that they're helping. A good witch who can find your lost coin or maybe create a love spell is someone who is, is performing a useful task in the community, or at least for your own benefit. One theologian, a very, uh, a very popular writer named William Perkins, really tried to shed a light on the dangers of these cunning folk. And he said, they are more insidious than the bad witches because people think they're helping, but their power still comes from the same source the devil. And so in that way, the devil is able to subvert the true covenant that exists between the godly and the divine and replace it with the covenant between the witch and the devil. So you see a lot of interesting parallels that witches had their pet familiars as a sort of model of bad motherhood, that the devil had his covenant with witches as a means of um, sort of bringing low uh, the relationship between God and the community of the faithful. The decline of witchcraft in early modern England is often identified with the later 17th century. So there were witchcraft persecutions beginning essentially when the law made it illegal, starting in the, the early 1560s. And then prosecutions continued through the end of the 1500s and into the early 1600s, and then most scholars begin to identify a bit of a lull. Um, England was actually a, a rather interesting place in terms of its legal structures in that most witchcraft cases came before what were known as assize justices. These were central court judges from London who rode on circuit throughout the country. In a lot of continental states, witchcraft trials were held in local communities with local juries. So you had a lot of potential for personal grudges and grievances being worked out. If you were an accused witch and 12 people were sitting in judgment on you and you'd been arguing with them for two decades, chances are your um, ability to be acquitted is going to be pretty low. These central court justices in England were trained judges. They had legal background. They usually had university education. And they made different circuits throughout the country. Some of those legal records still survive. A lot of them are lost. There are records from what's known as the home circuit, the counties around London, and then from the northern assize circuit. So we have rather imperfect records. But the records that do exist suggest that the assize justices were rather discerning in their evaluation of testimony. They weren't just voting to convict all the time or with great vigor. In fact, England's conviction rate was pretty low. It was in the 20s um, in terms of percentage. So again, that's a common misperception that everyone who was accused of witchcraft would end up burned at the stake. 
or hanged by the neck until dead or pressed between heavy objects. Um, in England, 75% uh, of those accused were not convicted. So we know that the elites had always been a, a little bit more reserved in the way that they treated testimony. What happens in the 1640s, though, in England was civil war. Um, for the decade of the 1640s and 50s, there's tremendous upheaval in the English state and in the English church. So there's a rise in prosecutions. And it's in the 1640s that we have one of the most interesting episodes from the history of early modern English witchcraft. And it's uh, associated with a figure named Matthew Hopkins. Matthew Hopkins and a partner of his, John Stern, um, sort of targeted the county of Essex and Hopkins billed himself as the witch finder general. And he essentially promoted his abilities to identify witches. And what happened as a result is what scholars sort of refer to as England's one real witch craze. In a small period in the middle of the 1640s, Essex experienced a pretty intense witch hunt, um, in large part led by the efforts of Hopkins. That witch hunt died out pretty quickly. Uh, there was a sort of momentary hysteria and then a calm followed and Hopkins found himself on the hot seat. Um, he was questioned pretty extensively about his activities and had to defend them. For example, under English law, torture was illegal in these kinds of criminal, uh, criminal investigations and there were rumors that Hopkins had committed torture, and that's how he got confessions from witches, that people did say, yes, it's true, I did it all, I was in league with the devil, and I sent out my pet imp Jack to work evil in the world. Well, why would someone say that? Hopkins apparently was someone who used sleep deprivation, and he was also charged with asking very leading questions. So keeping people up to the point of exhaustion and then hammering away with very leading questions that would result in confessions. But he was asked about it and he wrote kind of an apology, not saying he was sorry, but an attempted defense of his work. Another thing that he took flack for was making money. He billed himself as having certain skills as the witch finder general, but they were skills that could be acquired for a cost. And there was criticism that he used this whole process to enrich himself. And so in his defense of his activities, he essentially claimed traveling expenses. I took no more than I needed for food and drink and lodging. I wasn't getting rich on this exercise. But the way that he defends himself, you can see the nature of the criticism and the, the suspicion that this was not about malefic magic or this harmful magic. It was more about the um, desire of an individual to tap into the chaos and disorder of this period of the civil wars. Some of the court systems in England had been suspended during the Civil War. So if we go back to this earlier notion that people were using witchcraft as a means of exercising some of their own demons, um, trying to explain things that were unexplainable, trying to get revenge on someone with whom they had a long-standing grudge, a court case could provide some um, relief, right? But if the courts are suspended, if there is no legal means for bringing people to justice, then there's a real sense of frustration and fear that someone like Matthew Hopkins could play upon. After the Civil Wars period in the 1640s, we get the restoration of the monarchy in, in the early 1660s, and then there's another period of decline that scholars identify. So sort of from the 1660s onward, there's a real drop off in the number of accusations coming to trial. The last witch accused who was convicted was Jane Wenham in 1712. And in fact, her conviction was then overturned by a judge who found the evidence against her to be imperfect and flawed. The law criminalizing witchcraft was not repealed until 1736. But then think about that gap that exists, 1712 to 1736, no convictions. 
So scholars point to what's happening in the early 18th century as a, a change in the intellectual landscape of the early modern English elite that judges and justices were not going to vote to convict any longer. What gets more interesting is trying to suss out what the people believed. They might have continued to try to make accusations, but then been frustrated by um, non-conviction. And so we don't know the degree to which popular witchcraft beliefs declined along the same trajectory as elites. And so there are reports through the 18th century and beyond into the 19th century, even into the early 20th century, um, in various parts of Europe, accounts of witchcraft and women who were able to wield certain supernatural powers. If you read Time Magazine, if you watch the news broadcasts of today, you know that there are accusations of witchcraft in our contemporary world. There are a number of, uh, hopefully what will not turn into full-blown witch crazes in various African nations. Um, and so the ideas of witchcraft seem to be fairly universal, despite differences in time and place, despite pre-modern versus modernity, uh, there is something that's fundamentally necessary about witchcraft as meeting the needs of those who are looking for entertainment or who are looking for explanations. Witchcraft is fascinating because it represents the juxtaposition of humanity and the supernatural, right? The witch is able to wield supernatural power, but in a package that's just like us. And so that's the ultimate um, sort of fear is that there are people walking amongst us who look like us, but who have contracted themselves to the devil. I mean, that's what comes through the records of my time period is this real sense of alarm that there are people who have power that shouldn't. I just read a, a paper from my honors class this semester where a student essentially made that argument. It's really when you try to decode witchcraft, it's about power and trying to restore balance and stability in a time when those things were in relatively short supply. So again, we're back to this notion of witchcraft as satisfying certain socioeconomic, political, legal needs. And that's why I find witchcraft to be such a, uh, a really interesting topic because it's the nexus of almost every major pattern that we identify with the coming of modernity. It's about state building. Witchcraft isn't illegal until someone says it's illegal and then provides the legal mechanism to make sure that justice can be done. Witchcraft is about um, changing ideas concerning religion. It's about changing ideas about gender. A number of scholars who've looked at witchcraft and gender note that the early modern period was experiencing what we might call a crisis of patriarchy. This was a time in history in which men had roles of public power. And more broadly, Definitions of masculinity were usually associated with the ability to manage a household and to make a living. That's what manhood was about. The ability to be an adult man was very much predicated on one's socioeconomic successes. Well, in the 16th and 17th centuries, some men were not able to establish households. There were economic crises enough or a crisis uh, with land tenure or with various occupational opportunities that meant some men never did those things that their society identified with manhood. To make that even more troubling, some women in that time period were doing things that were associated with what it meant to be a man in the early modern period. We could point, for example, to the idea um, that we had ruling queens in the British Isles um, during the early modern period. Mary, Queen of Scots, um, Elizabeth Tudor and her sister Mary Tudor. When witchcraft was criminalized in England, that statute from 1563, that was the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign. And so some people have suggested um, that there was an intense concern about the ability of men to continue to rule 
And so that's why this particular set of explanations um, that witchcraft targeted women because of that anxiety and uneasiness as far as gender was concerned. Where things get even more messy is when we start looking at who was accusing whom. Because if we follow the scenario I've just put forward to its logical conclusion, we would expect men to be accusing women, that that's how this pattern would work. In fact, it was often women accusing other women. When you look at low-level records, it's usually one mother accusing an older widow or a wife accusing another wife. So what scholars have posited there is not only concerns about patriarchy, but concerns about femininity as well. If female ideals were very much attached to this notion of um, being a good mother and being a good wife and helping to run an orderly household, who then would it come back on when a child got sick? The mother has one job here, right? It's to take care of the children. If the child is sick, then that suggests perhaps that that mother wasn't doing her job properly. In her fear and concern and anxieties, easier than to point the finger at someone else. I'm not a bad mother. That old woman is to blame. She is the one, and I've seen her with her pet familiars, and then you get these what seem to be almost fantastical tales, but make a lot of sense once you start decoding the context behind them. Other scholars have focused in on economic motivations, that some people were very concerned about resources. And so what we get is jealousy over um, people who seem to be doing well, um, people who are taking advantage of certain, uh, certain changes in the economy. And so, yeah, there's a, a socioeconomic strand there as well that's pretty powerful. Jealousy, revenge. When you look at these accusations, you might imagine that this is a very heat of the moment kind of thing, that someone might tag the, the label witch on an individual in a moment of great anger, and sometimes that happened. But what the records also indicate is that often there was a very long history of animosity between the accuser and the accused that just happened to boil over in a particular fashion in the incident that is at the heart of the trial. But you find witnesses saying things like, she has been despoiling my livestock for these 13 years. You know, so there's a long period in which these parties have fallen out. And so you get a lot of interpersonal histories in this testimony. And again, that's part of what makes witchcraft such an interesting entry point into the past because on the surface you'd think, okay, I'm going to read these trial documents and I guess I'm going to find out a lot about what people thought of witches and magic. But what you find is people talking about their lived experiences. They talked about their memories of accused witches by um, associating them with particular times of the year or particular tasks that they were responsible for. I remember when such and such as child fell ill because that's when I took in certain cloth work from my neighbor um, and it was around Michaelmas because I remember making the contract deadline on this particular date. So you get all kinds of information that's fascinating to the modern historian that might have seemed somewhat um, peripheral at first glance, but then gives you a real sense of, of the past world. Um, it really does give us a lens through which to look at the, the real lived experiences of people four or five hundred years ago. I think there's a pronounced difference between belief in witchcraft and witchcraft prosecution. So belief in witchcraft, belief in supernatural power, seems to have remarkable resilience. Even in the face of science and in the face of all kinds of um, new information and new education, there is a, a continued attachment to the idea that individuals can wield supernatural power. That's one of the reasons I think it makes such a um, provocative theme for 
popular culture entertainments. People want to explore that idea. They want to um, sort of believe that there are strong people who can do fascinating things, can perform all of these amazing feats, and that makes good entertainment. So I think belief in witchcraft um, persists regardless of science and education. When we talk about the decline in prosecution, a number of scholars have suggested that there's a relationship between the coming of scientific revolution in the early modern period and the, um, the, the fall in accusations. It's a messy relationship, though, because scientific revolution, when you look at some of the early text, they're not appreciably scientific. Um, there, there's a, a sort of continuum or a spectrum of beliefs that today might appear to us to be um, rather unscientific that in that time period would have been considered a high form of intellectual endeavor. In other words, science itself was ill-defined in the late Middle Ages and early modern period, at least according to our definitions. We would have a tough time looking back at the intellectual endeavors of that time period and saying, oh, that's appreciably recognizable as science. And so it's not a case that science killed witchcraft. It seems that elites became more skeptical in part because of the search for natural laws and the kinds of scientific explanations that were being posited for various natural phenomena. But then we also have to account for changes in popular points of view. And as I say, it's difficult to ascertain a timeline for um, the non-elites, <laughs> this is such a terrible pun, giving up the ghost as far as witches were concerned. We don't know when their understandings of witchcraft as a viable force in the world really began to decline. A lot of the scholarship does suggest that it's about education. Another theory that's often put forward is the idea of the emergence of polite society that witchcraft became identified with the belief system of the vulgar masses. Those people who were ignorant were the ones who, who sort of attached themselves to these older superstitions. If you wanted to be a figure of cultivated intellectualism, then you rejected such old-fashioned notions. Well, if you are then sort of in the middling sort of society, you certainly don't want to be labeled part of the vulgar masses. And so you say, well, I guess witchcraft really isn't real. And so we begin to see people kind of mimicking those elites who were putting witchcraft beliefs aside. And that may have helped to turn the tide, this coming of polite society, where belief in the reality of witchcraft was something that was identified as um, inferior. The same time period that England was ramping up uh, its witchcraft prosecutions, it was also creating a very impressive platform of social legislation um, known as the Elizabethan Poor Laws. Passed right at the end of the 16th century, the English state tried to devise an institutional fashion for taking care of people who needed assistance. And what they did was to sort of shuffle English peoples needing assistance into different groups. They recognized that some people were deserving of aid, and they called them the deserving poor. I mean, that was the nomenclature of the day, the deserving poor. Maimed soldiers, guys who had been wounded in the service of their country, everyone agreed that they should be taken care of exactly how there was some debate. Um, orphans, the elderly, uh, who had lived past their period of being able to provide for themselves. And it was general consensus that um, people with certain physical challenges or mental challenges would fit in that same group. The laws also, however, identified the unworthy poor. They called them the idle poor. And they often referred to individuals as sturdy beggars. So that would have been a juxtaposition that shouldn't have worked. If you're sturdy, if you were able-bodied, if you were able to work, you should be doing so and not going around for a handout. And so what the laws did was suggest that English subjects were all entitled to having a roof over their head and having 
food. So in other words, their basic necessities should be met. And if they weren't being met by the individual, they should be met by this state uh, sort of institutionalized charitable structure. But the deserving poor tended to have fewer strings attached to the assistance they received. Now there was a potential issue for reputation problems that it might show you as diminished in your community if you had to ask for assistance. Some people felt that that was damaging to their pride or sense of self-worth. The Those who were considered the unworthy poor, they got assistance, but it was usually through punishment. They went to work in workhouses. Um, they might be given uh, thread to spin. So they were going to have to work. They were not going to be given a, a free handout. And what you did with the unworthy poor, what the English state did with the unworthy poor was something that continued to evolve over time. Did these people need job training? Um, if you gave them material to work, were they just going to continue to sponge off the state? In other words, how do you get individuals to return to or perhaps become for the first time a productive member of society. So I suppose this discussion of poverty is actually very much related to our conversation about witchcraft because there was a powerful link in early modern England between poverty and accusations of harmful magic. England had a problem with poverty in the late 16th century. The 16th century was a really problematic one in terms of economic issues. Inflation was rampant in the 16th century. Um, the general figure given is that real wages or the value of wages for labor performed doubled across the 16th century, but prices rose six times. So people found it very difficult to make ends meet. Certain portions of the population were doing quite well. Others were really struggling. And in fact, in the Elizabethan period, we get the emergence of a new category of poor people, not just the deserving poor or the unworthy poor, but the laboring poor. People who tried really hard and got seasonal employment when they could, but it was never enough to last the whole year around. So when you understand that poverty was a particular social ill, in the same time period as the witchcraft prosecutions, you can see that there's a pretty powerful connection between economic need, this uh, sense of competition and rivalry for resources, and witchcraft as a means of satisfying some of these anxieties and fears and, and un uh, sort of incidents of, of unhappiness concerning people's material circumstances. As the witching hour draws near, it's scholars like Dr. McNabb who help us understand and conceptualize witchcraft in early modern Europe. And while you don't have to believe in witches, you can learn a lot about witchcraft persecution from Dr. McNabb, a topic she covers in her early modern Europe history class here at Western Illinois University. So the next time you see a little witch knocking at your door, potentially asking for treats, Remember that today's fun, play-like perception of witches is much different from the women who were actually thought to be witches centuries ago in Europe. For The Purple Chair, I'm Amanda Shoemaker.